Hi there, it is uh, June 8th, and I'm going to be doing a instructional video today for the Excel workbook for the PPP loan expense tracker and forgiveness calculator on version 1.8. Version 1.8 was released on Saturday, June 6th, and it includes our interpretation of the Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act, which was passed on June uh, 4th, I believe, or 3rd, and the president signed it on June 5th. So we do expect that the SBA is going to be issuing some additional guidance on the uh, PPPFA, is what I'll refer to it as. So the updated worksheet for any additional guidance will be sent out as we've done in the past. So I'm going to start with the first page. Hopefully you'll see the screen up and you will see that I'm on the very first tab of version 1.8. It's now a red tab. It's just to call your attention because that's really the place you want to start. And as we update the versions, we'll add more information here, such as links to other outside information. Right now, we have just the instructional video link, which is actually to our original instructional video, which is up on YouTube. That'll get updated once this video is completed. So when you start on this page, the one thing that we've had to do to the workbook is add the 24-week option, which was passed in the PPFA. And by doing so, it expanded the workbook substantially, but it really isn't any co more complicated. It just now has tabs for both an eight-week option and a 24-week option, because if you remember, the PPFA left the eight-week optional covered period available to borrowers, which I believe is really important, and we should make sure that we are looking still at our original eight-week period. Any borrower that can gain 100% loan forgiveness using their eight-week period should take advantage of that. The first thing that I'm going to do is start on this page, and I've created a hyperlink to the two different um, periods, eight-week or 24-week. Uh, all tab colors are now associated with the, the number of weeks. So the eight-week period is green, are green tabs. The 24-week period are blue tabs. So they were originally green for the on the original uh, um, worksheets. So I kept that color obviously the same, and then we've added blue for 24-week. You'll see here that if I click on this link right here, it's going to take me automatically to the YouTube video for the instructional video. Now that'll change um, because we'll update that with this video. So when that's updated, you can go there. And the nice part about that is you can actually have that running if you have two monitors or you split your monitor, you can actually have that running at the same time you have this workbook open. So it's really a step-by-step -step guide. The other important thing I'm gonna mention before I go any further is documenting your information and your, your expenses associated with the PPP expense uh, tracker and the loan forgiveness calculator. It, I can't stress enough how important it is to track those expenses and the people that I've been working with in the last two weeks have who have come to their end of their eight-week period, some of them are scrambling now to go back and reconstruct expense data because they didn't do a very good job of it originally. So I do encourage you to use the expense tracker. We have learned that it, certain accounting programs like QuickBooks are helping borrowers with special reports that you can print from QuickBooks that are unique for the criteria for the expenses. But I want you to be really careful that you still double check those. I've seen some payroll expense reports that aren't accurate because they're still based on the original paid and incurred language that was in the statute, which we know now that the SBA has changed in the filing instructions for the forgiveness application and in the May 22nd guidance in the um, interim final rules. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't take anything you get from one of those programs um, for granted. You need to double check the numbers. So let's say that we're gonna start here. And I really, really, I put a question in here. If you're not sure what period to start with, always start with the eight week version. And the reason for that is, there's two reasons. The first reason is if you can gain the forgiveness, 100% forgiveness in the eight week period, then go for it and get it over with. I also have spoken to a lot of business owners that are overwhelmed by uh, this process and they don't really even like the idea of going 24 weeks. So always start with the eight week tab. 
unless you know for certain you, you're going to have to go the 24 weeks. Uh, maybe you're a restaurant or a retail store where there was just absolutely no way you could spend all the uh, PPP loan money in the eight-week period uh, on payroll. And if that's the case, then you're probably going to default to the 24-week. But it's really easy to enter data into the 24-week or in, in, enter data in the eight-week tab and then copy and paste it to the 24-week tab. So keep that in mind. You don't have to uh, duplicate your entries. So I'm going to click on the eight-week tab and go to the next item. And you can see it starts us right on the landing page for the expense tracker. And remember also, if you've uh, seen the prior video, and I'll stress it again right now, you enter data wherever there is a blue tab. Um, my firm name and my name and phone number are up here. This can all be uh, modified to customize it for another CPA firm or accounting firm or a, 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 anybody who's doing this work for a, a client. So you're going to enter data in the blue tabs. The, the, nothing's really changed as far as that's concerned. The first thing you're going to calculate is your eight-week applicable uh, covered period. Uh, you can also still use the alternative payroll covered period as far as we know. That's optional. So you'd enter the date of the starting date of your next payroll after the funding date if you're a biweekly or more often payroll payer. So if you pay your payroll semi-monthly, monthly, monthly um, any, anything other than biweekly or more often, you can't use the alternative payroll covered period. I'm not sure of the value of the alternative covered period anymore because of the fact that we now follow the guidance that tells us we can include payroll that was paid during the eight-week period, paid and incurred during the eight-week period, and incurred and paid with the next payroll period after the eight week period. So it seems to me that the alternative payroll covered period isn't really as important as it used to be. It does make your life a little easier because it matches up your pay periods with your exact eight weeks. If that um, makes it easier for you. The next item you're gonna enter is your loan amount and your emergency injury disaster loan advance payment. We all know now or should know by now the payment wasn't a grant, it was an advance, and the SBA is going to want that money back. So they're going to reduce your loan forgiveness by the amount of the advance you receive. So if you received any advance, you're not going to get 100% of the loan forgiven because part of the loan is going to, part of the forgiveness is going to be reduced by that advance. That's uh, disappointing, but that's what the SBA rule has been. So then in the expense tracker, you'll see that the um, you can enter the specific line items for each payroll item. You can see that this particular sample company, they use QuickBooks and they just ran reports for each payroll period and they just wrote C payroll summary. And that payroll summary will be sufficient backup that you provide to the lender. Um, you'll probably also need to provide uh, payroll tax returns or something for that period to show that you really did have that payroll. We still have the column here in column L where you can answer the question, yes, that you've attached, you've got the documentation and you've saved it. I'm recommending that people save all those documents in PDFs. The reason why is because I've heard from most banks that now are indicating the loan forgiveness application process is likely going to be through a portal. And so that means you're going to have to upload documents. You're probably not going to be able to physically provide documents to your lender. They don't want all that paperwork. So you're gonna to have to save those items in a PDF folder or something similar to that, or scan them in the day that you do your application. We also still have a, a link here uh, to the original forgiveness application from May 15th, and that goes uh, directly to the Treasury's website. So it gives you direct access to page 10 of the instructions that tell you what documentation you need to maintain. So always have that in front of you when you're gathering information for the loan amount. So then on the expense tracker, the next most important thing and the next item is entering the data for any payroll that was paid during this covered period for employees that received over $15,385. We know that is the maximum amount of compensation allowed for uh, an employee. 
We also are including in there owner employees whose compensation exceeded the lesser of 15385 or 850 seconds of their 2019 compensation. We're still wondering if that was maybe a mistake on the SBA's part, but that that rule's been around for a while now, nearly a month, and the SBA hasn't quote unquote fixed it. So we're still following that, that if you're an owner employee of an S corporation or a C corporation, you're very likely limited to the lesser of 15385 or 850 seconds of your payroll uh, for 2019 for your compensation. So you can see in Sample's case, uh, I have three different people in here. Bob Sample is, is the one that gets a little bit messed up on the fact that his payroll wasn't over $100,000 in 2019. So Bob has a cap of, in his case, 14769 because that's his base salary or his salary for 2019 was $96,000 and 850 seconds of that is 14769. So for purposes of the calculation, he's got a limitation. The other two people I put in the sample were paid over $100,000 in 2019, so their cap is still the 15385. So once you've entered all this data, you can go, we're gonna to go to the next page, but before we go to the next page, I do wanna point out one more thing, and that is you don't have to enter all this detail. If you did run a report from your accounting system that captured the health insurance, the gross payroll, the state and local payroll taxes, you can put totals on these lines. I've seen some people do that, and that's fine too. The, the worksheet still has all of the comments and references that were in the original version. So you just hover over any light yellow cell, cell and it will uh, pop up the comment and give you some additional guidance and information there. So the next item that we're gonna go to is the PPP Schedule A worksheets. Now the PPP Schedule A worksheets are patterned right after the forgiveness application. And here is where you're gonna enter the payroll data specifically by employee. And we've got, again, ye light yellow cells in certain spots where there is additional information that comes from uh, either the SBA or commentary from us. And you will enter everything where there's these light blue cells and you'll enter the employee's pay. And on here, you'll also enter whether they're full-time or part-time. And if they're part-time, you're gonna, you're gonna say no, that they're not a full-time employee. You're gonna put in the total hours they work during that eight week period. You're gonna tell the system whether or not you are going to elect the optional 0.5 FTE count for all part-time employees. Keep in mind our interpretation of that is if you do make that election anywhere in any of your FTE calculations, you have to stick with that calculation throughout all of your FTE calculations. So, so keep that in mind. So by doing this, this calculates your average FTEs for any employees that are in table one. Remember table one employees are employees that were making less than $100,000 per year salary or were not employed during 2019. So those are the employees that go on table one. Now, if you go back down out to the end here on table one, it calculates your FTEs, and here's your average FTEs for the table one employees. It's all done mathematically for you. Wherever there's a white cell, you don't enter any data. That is a calculation, and you can see there's formulas here. Uh, these formulas aren't protected any longer, so be careful with that. We've we've taken away the worksheet protections because it makes it easier for you to insert more cells and lines and copy formulas much easier. So that we've uh, we've made that a little bit easier on you. Um, if you did reduce an employee's average pay rate by more than 25%, then you will have to go to a pay reduction tab to calculate that information. So in sample company's case, I identified that one employee's pay was reduced by more than 25%. So the next item we're gonna go to is the pay reduction tab. And you can see it took me right there. On the pay reduction tab, it will pre-populate all of your employee data that you entered on the PPP Schedule A worksheets. 
but you do not need to enter any payroll information or wage information from, on any employee that you did not reduce their effective hourly rate by more than 25%. So in Sample's case, Alan Sample is the only employee that they gave a pay cut to of greater than 25%. So I'm gonna run through this real quick and show you how this works. It's kind of complicated. I don't think that the SBA could have made it any um, easier on us, but uh, it definitely is complicated. So in, in Alan's case, his original average rate was 54.67 an hour. He's paid pretty well, obviously, but we had to cut his pay to $26 an hour. We just couldn't afford to keep paying him. So the first thing we do is we calculate whether or not we do get the um, 25, meet the 25% test. And in this case, we didn't, we didn't in his case, because we, his retained salary was less than 75% of his original salary. So that means that we got to determine whether or not we can meet a safe harbor for that pay reduction. And so what the instructions tell us there is that if I restored Alan's pay back to his pre-COVID-19 pay rate by June 30th, remember this is for the eight week period, then I'm going to be okay. But if I didn't, then I've got a problem and I got to go out to the step three, which is to actually calculate the salary um, an hourly wage reduction amount. There, you're going to have to enter the average hours Alan worked per week during the first three months of 2020. And then you're gonna divide, you're gonna multiply that, and the system does it for you by the reduced pay rate. And then we're gonna identify whether or not this employee is salaried or hourly. And if they're hourly, you answer this question, yes. And then once you've answered that question, yes, it'll calculate automatically what their reduction is in their pay. And we call this the pay reduction penalty. So that is done for you now. It used to be a manual calculation that you were required to do. It no longer is. So you can see the number comes over automatically from the pay reduction tab and you're good to go. Keep in mind, if you don't have anybody whose pay was reduced by more than 25%, and we're talking about effective pay. So if you have a salaried employee that was making $1,000 a week prior to um, February 15th, and they take a pay cut of to, to $600, but they also work only three days a week, you've not changed their effective pay rate because you the 40% decrease in their pay is matched up with a 40% decrease in their hours. So that's really important to remember. That seems to be creating a lot of confusion for, for people. So the next section, tab table two in the PPP uh, Schedule A worksheets, that's for employees with an annual salary of more than $100,000 for any part of 2019. And the reason why they're separated is because you can reduce their pay by more than 25% and receive no pay reduction penalty for that. So that's why the SBA put them in a separate tab. In this case, you can see that every employee's compensation is still limited to the original 15385. There's no difference there. And you still calculate their FTEs. Now I would imagine most of these FTEs are going to be full-time employees. But in this case, I actually listed somebody here who uh, was a part-time employee, but did make more than $100,000 in the prior year. Uh, her name's Doris, and we put in her hours. We marked that she's a part-time employee, and we're not electing the FTE 0.5 calculation. So you can see that Doris only gives us a 0.3 FTE in our average. And then finally down here in the bottom <clears throat> is the owner's compensation. And there you can see that we've got two owners in the business. Bob is one of them, and Bob was the gentleman who's 2019 compensation was only $96,000. So instead of getting a $15,385 um, cap, his cap is, is capped at $14,769. And then you can see Mary's salary, her salary in 2019 was over 100,000. So her cap is 15,385. Then I'm gonna take you down to the, what we call the FTE safe harbor. <coughs> And the FTE Safe Harbor is kind of an interesting computation because 
if you meet if you meet the safe harbor, you don't have to provide any other FTE calculations on your application. But it's interesting that the only way to meet this safe harbor is that you would have had to have had a reduction in your FTEs for the period um, February 15th to April 26, 2020. So if you did have a reduction, then you would possibly qualify for the safe harbor. So in this case, you can see that the company didn't have a reduction. They actually had a higher FTE average in this period than on February 15th. Now, before I go any further, I'm gonna to go to the next item and show you how those are calculated. And you're gonna to go to what we call the um, FTE calc for safe harbor. And here, this is where it starts to get a little complicated because you've got to uh, put in all of the payroll, all the employee information, and then you've gotta start entering their hours for all these different periods. There's three to start with in the safe harbor. The first one is the what their FTE, their average FTE was for the pay period that straddles February 15th, 2020. So if you're a biweekly payroll uh, payer, then you would just find whatever biweekly period that contains February 15th. And you can see in this case, you just put in whether they're full-time or part-time. And if they are full-time, you don't have to put in their hours. If they're part-time, you put in their hours. And then you have to put in the number of weeks this was for. So in this particular example, sample company pays their payroll bi-weekly, so you put in a two. And by putting in a two, it's just going to calculate the number of hours that the person worked and what their FTE calculation is for that period. So it's, it's fairly straightforward and you don't have to worry about any of the white cells in this case as well. The next payroll period you're gonna look at is the February 15th to April 26th payroll period. Now there, it's approximately 10, 10 weeks of pay but you will have to actually calculate the hours because it's a specific date range, February 15th to April 26th. So when you put that data in, <clears throat> it'll calculate what their average FTE was for that period of time. And then the last FTE calculation you're gonna do for the safe harbor is the payroll period that included June 30th. Similar to the February 15th payroll FTE calculation, this one calculates the FTEs on the payroll period that straddled June 30th. Again, you just find whatever pay period that was. And then in this case, you put in their hours again, and you do put in the number of weeks that the payroll period is for, because that's how it calculates the FTEs. It brings down totals. And then if we go back to the PPP Schedule A worksheets, <coughs> it'll bring the numbers over. <coughs> Excuse me. You can manually enter these numbers here. You don't have to use the FTE calculations for the safe harbor. Some people have told me that they keep their employees hours and they have them by date and they're just gonna manually calculate it. So you can hard key a number in these two cells. If the, if the payroll FTE calculation for the period February 15th to April 26th is less than what they were on February 15th, this answer here would be yes. And then you'd have to enter what the FTE calculation was as of June 30th or bring it over from the prior worksheet that I just mentioned. That comes over automatically. But in this case, because the answer is no, and I wanted it to be no, I didn't want them to meet the safe harbor so I can show you the other FTE calculations. But in this case, since the answer is no, this is left blank. It just, there's no need for a number there because you don't meet the safe harbor. And it tells you that the safe harbor is not met. And that means that you have to go to the next calculation, which can be a little bit more challenging. So once we've done our payroll data and we've done our FTE calcs for the safe harbor, the next item we're gonna look at is the PPP Schedule A. Now, PP Schedule A is where you start having to enter less data. You've pretty much done a lot of the legwork, and now the worksheet's going to start doing some real calculations for you. So you can see all of these cells that are white, 
there is no entry data required. All this information comes from the prior worksheets that you have completed. The only information on the PPP Schedule A worksheet tab you have to complete um, is a couple items here at the bottom. The first one, and this is the one I cannot uh, stress enough its importance, and that is this one question that's on the application. And it says, if you have not reduced the number of employees or the average paid hours of your employees between January 1st and the end of your covered period, you can answer this question yes. It's actually a box you check on the forgiveness application. If you answer this question yes, stop. You are done with your FTE calculations. You do not need to do any more FTE calculations because you're gonna achieve 100% loan forgiveness because you're telling the lender and the SBA, I never changed any of my FTEs, I never changed any of my pay, I've never changed any of my pay rates, I, I'm good to go. And surprisingly, there's quite a few businesses that will qualify for that. So if you did answer this question yes, then you don't have to do any other FTE calculations. In, this, in Sample's case, of course, I wanted to answer it no, because I wanted to be able to show you how the rest of the worksheet works. Now we're gonna go into what's called the FTE reduction quotient. And again, another complicated aspect of the PPP loan program. Here is where you're going to identify your reference period FTEs. These reference periods are set in the statute. And what the statute says is that if I restore my FTE count um, to a certain number during my covered period, I will compare that number to two prior periods, possibly three prior periods, and see if I have an overall reduction. So the first prior period you're going to look at is February 15th, uh, 2019 to June 30th, 2019. The second period is June, January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. And the Third one is only applicable if you're a seasonal employer. So if you're a seasonal employer, you're gonna also be able to pick any 12 week period between May 1st, 2019 and September 15th, 2019. And that they'll let you use that count if it's lower. So what you're trying to do here is find the lowest number of these three numbers. Now in Sample's case, I said, yes, they are a seasonal employer because I wanted to show you how the math works. Seasonal employers might be um, vacation properties, resorts, um, properties that are um, only open for part of the year, landscaping companies, uh, similar businesses like that. So you're gonna go to, to calculate these items. You can manually enter all of the FTE calculations if you've done them on your own, or you can go over to the FTE calculation tab for Schedule A. And again, you're gonna be a little overwhelmed, but it's, it, once you get the concept of it, it's, it's pretty easy to follow. So here you're going to enter all of the information for the employees for these applicable weeks, February 15th, 2019 to June 30th, 19, which is roughly 19 weeks. And then you're gonna have another one for January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020, which is approximately 8.6 weeks. The uh, SBA couldn't make that simple on us. And then the last one, if you're a seasonal employer, any 12 week period you choose between, February, between May 1st, 2019 and September 15th, 2019. So you'll enter all of the data. If they're full-time employees, you automatically get an FTE of one. If they're part-time employees, you're gonna put in their hours and it's gonna calculate their uh, FTE and it's gonna round it to the nearest 10th because that's what the uh, SBA instructions tell us to do. So once I've entered all of the hours data for my employees in the FTE calculation for Schedule A, I'm gonna come back to Schedule A and follow the rest of the calculation here. Um, down in this section here, we're gonna talk about the FTE reduction exceptions. Now we know we had four exceptions in the original guidance and in the PPPFA that was uh, signed by the president on Friday, they've given us actually three more, in my opinion, um, FTE reductions. So the original ones were um, you, you tried to rehire an employee and they rejected the rehire. 
we now know that you have to get that in writing and you've got to report that employee to your state unemployment authorities. Don't forget to do that, otherwise you might not be counting that. So in Sample's case, if they had um, let an employee go and then tried to rehire in the, the employee and the employee rejected the rehire, they can get, and it was, let's say in this case, it was a full-time employee, they can get another one FTE for that. And you can see just by adding that one FTE, it does change their FTE reduction quotient, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But I can't stress enough, that don't skip over these items here. Really think about it. If you're doing this for a client, make sure that you ask them really specific questions on this. The SBA gave us another gift by saying that if we terminated an employee during the period for cause, then I can still count their FTE equivalent. So if it was a full-time employee, then I would put a one there. And then we have another one for an employee who elected to terminate employees. Uh, employment. So if you have somebody that quit, then you can count them still. If you have an employee who re requested a reduction of their hours, let's say you had a full-time employee that uh, was working 40 hours a week but decided they could only work 20 hours a week, that 0.5 FTE doesn't count against you. You could put that in here, so you just simply add a 0.5. I put to the side here, you know, the SBA has told us with all of these FTE reduction exceptions, we've got to document it. We've got to get it in writing. So if an employee makes that kind of request to you, just make sure that you get that in writing from the employee. Now we know in the PPPFA, they've identified three more, essentially three more exceptions. And the first one is, and they're all really a little vague. And so I put a note out here that we're really waiting for further guidance from SBA on how to document this, because the first one simply says that you were unable, you had, you, I think the language exactly is inability uh, to rehire. So we have no idea what that means yet. It could mean a lot of different things, but if you've got a circumstance that, that, that suits, then I would encourage you to put the FTE there. They also have one for people that you couldn't hire or rehire or fill a position for a qualified person. So I'm a partner in a CPA firm and we are looking for a CPA to hire and I can't find one. So I've got advertisements out, I'm working with placement agencies, I've documented that I'm looking for somebody. So let's say I was looking for a full-time CPA and I can't find them, as long as I have documentation for that, I think I could still count that as one of my exceptions to, to my FTE reduction. And then the last one is an interesting one, it's where the Congress decided to, to help small businesses like restaurants and doctor's offices particularly that were forced to close uh, by an order from the CDC, HHS, or even OSHA. So if you have a circumstance like that, let's say that you had 10 employees that couldn't come to work because your business was forced to close. For that period of time in which those 10 employees couldn't come to work, you can still count their FTE uh, equivalency for that period. Again, we're gonna wait for guidance on how to calculate that, but by having these really now seven different FTE reduction exceptions, it really has taken the bite out of the um, FTE test that the original statute had. Um, and, and it's quite interesting that they've done that because the whole purpose of the law was to um, maintain and retain your payroll and your employees. And essentially now you could not retain them and still necessarily meet 100% loan forgiveness if a lot of your employees that aren't with you any longer are working less hours or because of these, one of these seven reasons or a combination thereof. In Sample's case, again, I just skipped all that. I wanted you to see the math but you can always add one in and you can see what it does to the, to the total. It's quite, it can be quite remarkable. So in Sample's circumstance, their average FTEs for the covered period, which comes from up here, these are automatic calculations, gets brought down here. And you can see that they've got a little bit of a problem because their lowest reference period FTE count is 6.5 but their FTE count for their covered period is only 5.9. So they have a little bit of a problem. 
which it means that they only get a 91% FTE reduction quotient. So why that's important, I'll go to the next item and you'll see why. I'm gonna to go to the loan forgiveness application and here take a sigh of relief because there's nothing you have to enter on this page. This page is completely completed based on the information you've put on all the previous tabs. And it's really a mirror image of the forgiveness application that was published on May 15th. Uh, we'll update it if we get a new application, but for right now, it's based on the May 15th uh, uh, forgiveness application published by the SBA. So it brings over your total payroll costs that have been adjusted for any employees that uh, were paid more than uh, $100,000 annual salary. It brings over your mortgage interest payments from the expense tracker. It brings over the lease payments from the expense tracker and the utility payments from the expense tracker. It subtracts out the amount of pay, um, pay reduction penalty that you have because you reduced an employee's pay by more than 25%. And so it gives you a total amount of qualified expenses, if you will, for the covered period. Here's where the, the FTE reduction comes, comes into play. Because Sample Company didn't achieve 100% FTE reduction quotient, they only received 91%, the maximum amount of these expenses that they can have forgiven is $102,296.02. So now we know that's our maximum amount of loan that we can have forgiven. There are other tests. If the loan amount was lower than 102, then that would be the amount of forgiveness. And then we have the last test, which says my payroll cost has to exceed, meet or exceed 60% of my total forgiveness. So in this case, if I take my payroll costs, 87,199, and divide it by 0.6, I know that I could get up to $145,000 of loan forgiveness. So then you're done with the forgiveness application, and we've added a, another line item that just shows you for your information what your loan balance is after the loan forgiveness. The loan balance is simply the original loan amount minus the loan forgiveness plus the amount of the EIDL advance that you received. So in Sample's case, if you recall, their EIDL advance was $8,000, and that's how we end up with a loan balance of $25,703.98 for Sample Company. The next item I'm going to go over is the um, report. There, we, we've created a report letter that this is primarily for CPAs and accountants and attorneys that are doing this for their clients. It's not maybe so much for an individual company, but it is still a nice report letter that can be printed out and it's, it comes out very really nice and you can download it to Word. And we've even suggested that maybe some people provide this to their lender um, as a supplement to their forgiveness application. I think if your lender got this, they would be pretty impressed. So that's it for the eight week covered period calculation. The 24 week, the next item I'm gonna go into is the blue tabs. And if you recall, if I take you back to the original landing page, if you did not go to the green tab, if you wanted to go directly to the blue tab, it takes you directly to the first 24 week test. And so here, the expense tracker is exactly the same. The only difference is I've made it a little bit longer because now we've got 24 weeks instead of uh, eight weeks. We've changed all of the calculations to reflect 24 weeks and not eight weeks. You can copy and paste your input data from the eight week pages to the 24 week pages. And in this case, that's what I did here. And then just to make things easy on myself, I just put in a line item for additional expenses for the next 16 weeks, but you could enter all the detail here. I'm not gonna necessarily run through every single tab in the 24 weeks uh, re, uh, section because it is exactly the same as the eight week. You still put in the payroll information on the PPP Schedule A worksheets. You still put in the FTE calculations. The only difference everybody is that we're just dealing with a more time. Instead of eight weeks, we're dealing with 24 weeks now. 
as far as we know, we're still going to be allowed to use the 0.5 FTE calculation for part-time employees if we choose to. So nothing's different as far as that's concerned. The PET PPP Schedule A is essentially the same as well. I mean, the only difference really is, is that your payroll amounts will change, obviously. Your FTE calculations still come from the FTE calcs for both the safe harbor and for the 24 week reference period. I mean, the, the reference periods under the original uh, uh, loan instructions. So we still have the same reference periods here. We don't change that as far as we're concerned. The safe harbor changes slightly because now instead of using the eight week covered period for our safe harbor, we're using the 24 week, which could. Uh, proved to be a challenge for some businesses because we don't know what the rest of 2020 is going to have for us. And it might be a challenge to retain our employees beyond June 30th if the money runs out. Remember, the money was based on, the loan was based on two and a half months worth of payroll. And now the Congress is expecting you to somehow stretch that out over 24 weeks. So if you have to let go of a lot of employees after your money runs out, which certainly would be sad, it could significantly affect your FTE calculation. So keep that in mind. But if I go out to the remaining tabs, you can see also the pay reduction tab is a similar layout for anybody whose pay was reduced by more than 25%. The only difference here is you have more time to, we believe you're gonna have more time to uh, restore their pay uh, based on the 24 weeks, we'll have to see what the SBA says about that. They might keep the June 30th date. Uh, right now, we're assuming that they're going to follow suit and let the pay restore restoration happen during the 24-week process. So in this case, the only difference is because now we're talking about 24 weeks and not eight weeks, the amount of pay reduction could be higher based on the formula. So if I go back to the Next item, I'm gonna take you to the PPP Schedule A worksheet for the 24 week covered period. And you can see here in sample company's case, they still don't meet the, they didn't rehire people, they didn't get people back to the point where their FTEs during the covered period were greater than the reference period. So in this case, they're still looking at a FTE reduction quotient which reduces their loan forgiveness. But I'm gonna point out why that's not as big a deal now, and this is really important. So if I go to the loan forgiveness application tab now, you can see my payroll cost is a lot higher than it was in my eight week period. The sample company kept paying their employees. They did have fewer employees by FTE count, but they kept paying those employees. So now my payroll cost is quite a bit larger because I'm talking about three times more time, 24 weeks versus eight weeks. Obviously my covered expenses, uh, my covered non-payroll expenses for mortgage interest, rent, and utility payments are all a lot higher too. In this case, they're three times higher. My salary and hourly wage reduction penalty is higher. So my total is a lot higher. So now the fact that I have a 91% FTE reduction quotient doesn't hurt me as much because I have a lot more expenses I can count towards the loan amount, the loan forgiveness amount. My loan stayed 120,000. We didn't get to change our loan just because we got more weeks to pay the expenses. So you can see in this case, I could have borrowed a lot more money and still met 100% loan forgiveness just based on the fact that 60% of my loan, way more than 60% of my loan, was used for payroll. In this case, it's over 100%. So the 60% requirement for the 24 weeks seems to be a little bit of a odd calculation because I think it's gonna be really hard for people not to meet that requirement. I suppose if your business really, really declined and didn't come back during the entire 24 weeks, then you might have an issue. But otherwise, I think most people will meet the 60% test. So in this case, my qualified expenses now are a lot higher than they were in the eight week. You can go back to the eight week tab and look at that and you'll see that obviously the expenses are higher. My loan amount stayed the same, it's my original loan amount, 
My 60% test is a lot higher because my payroll is a lot higher. So in sample companies' case, by extending their covered period from eight weeks to 24 weeks, they can achieve 100% loan forgiveness. And all they're going to have to pay back is the EIDL advance. So the purpose of me showing you that is to explain that in this case, in this company's case, they would want to go ahead and elect the 24 week covered period because they can get 100% loan forgiveness. If, in, if instead the sample company was able to meet the 100% loan forgiveness in the eight week period, and I'll take you back to that, uh, we'll go to the schedule A for the eight week period. Go back a little more. There we go. If we go back here, let's say that sample company um, fired an employee during their covered period uh, for cause. So now you can see their, their adjusted FTE count is greater than their reference period count, and they're achieving 100% loan forgiveness. So if you go to the loan forgiveness application, you can see in this case, their total costs were $112,699. Their loan was 120. Now their loan forgiveness is 112,699. It's the full amount of the expenses they incurred, and their loan balance is only 15,301. But if loan, but if sample companies' payroll costs had been higher during the covered period, so let's say a hard key that, let's just say $100,000. In this case, now 100% of the loan is forgiven. So naturally, they would want to file their loan forgiveness application after the end of their eight weeks and not wait the 24 weeks. The sooner you file, the better because of the fact that the statute of limitations starts running at the later of the loan forgiveness um, or the payoff of the loan itself. So that, folks, in a nutshell, is the instructions on how to complete the expense tracker and forgiveness uh, application calculation. And we can um, update this as new forms and guidance come out from the SBA, as we certainly will do. Thank you very much for your time and you have a great day.